Marcus Mariota won the Heisman Trophy only seven to eight years ago. Not too long after that, he was drafted number two overall in the 2015 NFL Draft. It goes without a single doubt in my mind, he was arguably one of the most popular and most liked college athletes of all time. Looking back on when he was playing at Oregon, I don't know a single person that hated him or disliked him. It was hard to hate on this man. As nice and humble as he was, it was hard to find anything to hate on. His humbleness attitude was not the best part about his character. It was definitely his skill and talent. Mariota was lighting up defenses in the Pac-12 conference. In only three seasons, he threw for over 10,000 yards and over 100 touchdowns. When you talk about some of the greatest quarterbacks of all time at the college level, I can't believe his name doesn't come up. Shortly after his legendary college career, he got drafted in the first round with the second overall pick by the Tennessee Titans. Everything was looking super good for him. He was the franchise quarterback for a solid NFL team. But then out of nowhere, chaos struck, and I mean quick. This guy's life did a complete 180 within a blink of an eye. It doesn't make sense how somebody can go to a franchise quarterback who everybody knows, loves, and talks about all the time to only one to two years later, it's almost like he vanished. I mean, let's be real here. When's the last time you've heard Marcus Mariota's name brought up? It's been a minute. I'm really interested because not only do I want to share this with you, but I want to get to the bottom of what happened. There's a lot of unanswered questions. There's many things that happen. But however, it leaves us with the main question today. What really happened to Marcus Mariota? What's good y'all? Hope you're having a bus day. Real quick, this video is sponsored by me. I don't do no BS sponsorships on this channel. The only thing I'm going to ask and will forever ask is for you to hit that subscribe button and leave a like. That's what helps the channel out. As long as you do that, I'm not going to do sponsorships. Let's continue on. Marcus Mariota. When I think about his college days, I get a little nostalgia because I feel like life was way simpler back in those times. It was really cool to watch him play in college. You know our story's not going to start there though. We got to throw it all the way back to where things started. Mr. Marcus Mariota played his high school football for St. Louis High School in Honolulu, Hawaii. His high school career in recruiting is kind of tricky. He was a great quarterback and a good prospect, but when you live in Hawaii, it's hard to get the recognition you deserve. ESPN only had him listed as a two-star recruit, 24-7 Sports had him as a four-star, and a different recruiting website had him as a three-star. There was some buzz around his name. I feel like if he lived in the inner parts of the United States, like Florida or California, he would have been maybe a four or five-star for sure. Even though he didn't get a lot of love, it didn't matter. He was balling out. In his senior season, he threw for 2,597 yards, had a 65 completion percentage, had 32 touchdowns to only 5 interceptions. He also had 60 rush attempts for 455 yards. Not too shabby. You could say he was before his time, but I would say at around that time frame of 2010 and 11, that's when dual threat quarterbacks were becoming popular. Sit back and think about it. Before 2010, there wasn't that many dual threat quarterbacks in college football. That's before the Johnny Manziel era, and that's also the same time when Cam Newton was going to Auburn. I wouldn't say he was ahead of his time, but I will say defenses were not prepared for quarterbacks like him like they are now. With Mariota being relatively unknown for a high school quarterback, he decided to go to a school where he felt like he could play right away and that school was no other than Oregon. When he arrived on campus at Oregon in 2011, he did redshirt in his first season. In 2012, it was on. His talent was on full display. He helped lead Oregon to a 12-1 overall record and was the Pac-12 Freshman Player of the Year and the Offensive MVP in the Fiesta Bowl. I mean, when we break down and look at his freshman numbers, it's almost as good as it gets. In his 13 games, he threw for 2,677 yards, had 32 touchdowns to only 6 interceptions. That's flat out amazing. Once again, I'm going to re-emphasize it. He was a freshman. As great as that season was, you know, you had some people saying, could he do better? Is he going to have a sophomore slump? And well, he shut up those critics quickly. In the following season, 2013, it was as great, if not better, than his freshman season. He jumped his yards up to 3,665, had 31 TDs to 4 interceptions. Nobody could figure out how to stop this man, and they couldn't figure out what made him so good. In my opinion, I definitely believe what made him so good was his elusiveness in the pocket, and he could also scramble if he needed to or wanted to. He wasn't a guy that would run freely like a Tim Tebow, Johnny Manziel, or Cam Newton. 
he only ran when he had to. But here's the thing. When he was running, he was almost as elusive as a wide receiver or running back. He wasn't your typical pocket passing quarterback, but he also didn't scramble like others. It was a mix of both. And then to top that off, I would even go on the record to say what made him even harder to defend is when he did leave the pocket, he would always have his eyes upfield to throw the ball deep. So when he got out the pocket, defenders would come up off of the receivers, he would launch the ball 50 yards. Heading into what would turn out to be his last college season in 2014, he balled out. He threw for, and yes, this is correct, 4,454 yards, had 42 touchdowns to only four interceptions. Do I need to say anything about those numbers? You guys know, they're tremendous. And what was so pleasing about him is that he somehow got better each and every season, even though the year before was always great. Look at the numbers right now. He always increased his touchdown to interception ratio and always threw for more yards. And that right there is what you want to see in a player, always continuing to get better. I'm going to read off all the awards he won in 2014 so you can understand how great he was. He won the Heisman Trophy, Maxwell Award, Manning Award, Walter Camp Award, Davey O'Brien Award, Johnny Golden Arm Award, AP Player of the Year, was a Sporting News Player of the Year, Pac-12 Offensive Player of the Year, and was a unanimous All-American first team. All of those things I read off wasn't over his career. That was in one season only in 2014. I want to see this guy's house. It's got to be decorated to the max. After he won the Heisman, he decided there was no need to go back to Oregon, and he put his name in the NFL draft, where ultimately he would be selected with the second overall pick by the Titans. Remember going into college how there wasn't a lot of hype surrounding his name? It was a different story in the NFL. He had the highest selling jersey as soon as he got drafted. And now here's where things really, and I mean really, get interesting. When he got drafted by the Titans, it was a perfect love story. They finally got a great quarterback and they anticipated him to be their franchise quarterback for many years to come. But as we all know, that didn't happen. For the season 2015, his rookie year, it wasn't good, but I'd also say it wasn't bad. It was mediocre. He only played in 12 games, had a completion percentage of 62, threw for 2,800 yards with 19 touchdowns to 10 interceptions, with a QBR of 48, and that's based on a scale 1 to 100, with 50 being average. I'm not going to sit up here and debate his rookie numbers. They were okay. We'll leave it at that. Let's continue on. Oh yeah, before we move on, I forgot to throw in there, at the end of his rookie season, he suffered a sprain MCL where he missed the last few games. Why is that a big deal and why did I feel the need to throw that in there? Because it has a part to do with something later. Let's continue on. In his second season, it was much better and gave some people hope. His completion rate was right at 61, threw for 3,400 yards, had 26 touchdowns to only 9 interceptions, so he improved, and his QBR was at 59. At this point in time in our story, everyone was feeling good. They was like, okay, we're moving in the right direction. He had a good or you can debate it, but I'll say he had a good second season. His third year is going to be better, and by his fourth or fifth year, he could be a Pro Bowl quarterback. As much as I would have liked to see that for him, in 2017, it was atrocious. The same thing, he threw for a little over 3,000 yards, but he had 13 touchdowns to 15 interceptions. You don't like to see that. I understand numbers are deceiving, but when you're telling these story videos, they definitely help give a perspective on why a player didn't succeed at what they were doing. I like to show you guys and talk about the numbers because, quite frankly, I can't sit up here and show you and talk about every single game from 2015 to 2020. The video would be four hours long. So based off of the numbers right there, we can all assume and look at it. We have a brain. We can come to the terms and say that he wasn't progressing in his NFL career. I'm not even going to say he was regressing or getting getting worse. I'm just saying he flatlined. He wasn't getting better. And when you're a quarterback in the NFL, if you're not already great, you got to continue to get slightly better every season or they're going to cut you. They don't care. I remember going into 2018, there was people questioning if he could be an NFL quarterback and if he was the right man for the job. Once again, I'm going to read out these numbers. You can tell it wasn't too much better. In 14 games played, he only threw for 2,500 yards with 11 touchdowns to 8 interceptions, QBR 50. You see what I'm talking about every year? He's not getting better whatsoever and his QBR is always around 50. And once again, it wasn't just the numbers. If you were watching him play, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It was almost like he couldn't read defenses like he could at the college level. I know the NFL is way harder to play in, but I feel like he should have got better as his years continue to go on. Another factor I want to throw in there that not too many people mention, 
He got sacked a lot, and I mean a lot. The offensive line didn't help him out that much. Also, one thing I want to touch on before we get into 2019, I felt like he was indecisive in the pocket and was never a confident quarterback. You know how when you watch Tom Brady play, you can see the swagger and confidence he possesses? I never saw that in Mariota. I always saw him as a very timid quarterback who was playing not to lose his job. He wasn't playing to win, he was playing just to keep his position. I'm going to read you off these last stats and then we'll touch on some of the juicy stuff on what really happened. In 2019, there was even more pressure on him to succeed and it didn't go so well. In 7 games played, he threw for 1,200 yards with 7 TDs to 2 interceptions and a miserable career worst quarterback rating of 35 points. Another bumpy season for Mariota. Honestly, every year was rough for him except for maybe one or two. He got benched in their week six loss to Denver, and he's now replaced by the current star for the Titans, Ryan Tannehill. Some people thought maybe this was a temporary thing. It turned out once Ryan Tannehill got the job, he never looked back. You can't even blame the Titans. They were getting nowhere at Mariota. They were going 8-8, eight and 6-9. Eight, and nine. They just had mediocre seasons every single year. And it was his fault because he's a quarterback. In the NFL, that's how it goes. If you're winning, quarterback gets the glory. If you lose, he gets all the hate. But hold on, hold on, hold on. It's not quite as simple as Mariota wasn't playing good. There's way more to it. All throughout his NFL career, he was battling injuries left and right. In 2015, like I already stated, he had an MCL sprain where he had to miss some of the end of the season. In 2016, he broke his fibula in week 16 versus the Jaguars. In 2017, he had a hamstring injury that sidelined him for a game. And in 2018, he had an elbow injury. That elbow injury cost him two more games. You see what I'm saying? He was always nicked up. Although he didn't miss a lot of games, when he's missing one to two, three games a year, it's some uncertainty as a head coach you don't like to see. It wasn't just the injuries either. He had a different offensive coordinator in each of his first five seasons. That's hard to deal with. Sometimes in life, no matter how hard you try, they're not meant to work. In Marcus Mariota in Tennessee, I never felt like it was meant to succeed. Tennessee would go on to finish out 2019 strong with Ryan Tannehill at quarterback, and that told Marcus everything he needed to know, so he left. On March 25th in 2020, he would sign a two-year contract, $17 million deal with the Las Vegas Raiders. In 2020, he played in one game, and he had 226 yards, one touchdown, one interception for the season, but in 2021, he hasn't played at all. It's kind of funny how quickly your life can change. In 2019, he was the starting quarterback for the Titans, who were not a terrible team at all. You know, you gotta understand, Mariota, he wasn't playing for the Browns, who were terrible, or a team like that. He was playing for a good organization, and now, fast forward in time to 2021, Nobody knows where he's at and nobody talks about him. You could look at it from this standpoint, at least he's getting paid millions of dollars to be the backup. And he's a solid backup. If Carr goes down, he could win him a game or two. Here's the main question. Is Mariota good enough to be a quarterback one in the NFL or is he only a backup? Let me know what you think. I would like to see him get another shot because Tennessee, like I said, it was never a good fit. He could be a better fit for a different team. You never know unless it happens. It's really sad how everything played out considering he was one of the best college quarterbacks of all time. And for Tennessee, he wasn't terrible, just not the right guy for the team. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt solely because if he goes to a different team, I don't think he'd be terrible. I think he'd be okay, and he could win some games as a starting quarterback. I'm wishing Marcus the best of luck. Hope he continues to see a lot of success in his football career. Let me know what you think about this down below. But with all that being said, it's going to wrap it this video. Hope you guys enjoyed. Hope you guys learned something. Hit that subscribe button for me. Please help the channel out a lot. Leave a like. Do all that nice stuff. And as always, let's be great. I'm out, y'all. Peace.